Last year, CSIRO released a landmark report analysing the impact of artificial intelligence on science. As a science journalist, it seems to me that the scientific research I report on increasingly involves AI, at least in some way. But is this really the case? How has the use of AI in peer-reviewed research actually changed over the decades? Bottom line is we find that it has grown from around 2% at the turn of the century to now 5.7%. And that sort of sounds like small numbers, but in terms of total scientific output, that's huge. And the recent time is where it's been steepest. The field of AI got its name at the, at the Dartmouth Conference in 1956. So if we, we started our analysis in 1960 soon after. And it went from about 40 research fields to 98% of all research fields today. And it, it took off pretty quickly. So what's interesting is how far and wide AI has got, the, the extent of adoption and the depth of adoption. And then we could also explore some of the really amazing applications we're seeing within certain fields of research where AI has given the scientists a really big boost. So let's take the case of nuclear fusion research. So as you'll know, the being able to generate electricity on an industrial scale from nuclear fusion is the thing. You know, it completely changes things like the, the climate change story would get totally changed if that invention were to occur. So it's a it's a holy grail of scientific research. Can't do it yet. But earlier this year, I think it was in February, a paper was published in Nature, which was a combined authorship from Google DeepMind and other science experts, nuclear physicists who are working on the problem. And they used a machine learning approach to control the shape and configuration of the superheated plasma inside a device called a tokamak with an electromagnetic field. Now, this uh, plasma can't touch anything because it's so hot, it would cause an explosion. So it has to be suspended in this electromagnetic field. And the shape and configuration of the plasma is a key to being able to sustain that reaction. Now, machine learning was used to try some variations that hadn't been done before, and it came up with variations of the, the size and structure and shape of the, the plasma. Bottom line is it, it sustained that reaction for longer than we've ever seen, and we've seen a um, uh, nuclear fusion for electricity generation get back on the agenda again. And the scientists in the field said, you yeah, know, this is a big, really big step forward for our field. It doesn't completely change everything they're doing, but it is a big boost. Our own scientists in CSIRO used artificial intelligence approaches for the design and testing of solar panel but during the, the um, pandemic, they came up with a robotic system because the staff couldn't get into the office, into the laboratory to test the panels. So they they basically uh, used a machine learning robotics approach that could test 600 times the number of panels for these flexible solar panels than previously. And that is also allowing them to really significantly uplift the efficiency of those panels and get a, get a science outcome. With this, you know, current boom in the uptake of these AI technologies, is there any sign that it's going to slow down at any point soon? No, and that's something we've looked at quite a bit. AI has gone through two boom-bust cycles in the past. They're referred to as the AI springs and the AI winters. The first winter was from 1974 to 1980, and in that period leading up to 1974, there was heightened, there was a surge of interest, there was a you know, a, a bubble of excitement and it did sort of deflate and decline and went pretty quiet for that period. Then the next one was from 1987 to 1993. That's a winter and it was preceded again by a boom. Now, at the moment, we're seeing a boom and a surge and it is off the charts to anything before. The, the lines on the graph are so incredibly steep now. But our analysis and that of several other researchers that have looked at this around the world is that this current cycle is a bit different for a couple of reasons. The size of it, it's huge compared to what we've seen before. There's just an enormous uptake of AI and development of AI across so many fields of science, in particular machine learning, but other fields like computer vision and natural language processing. So the size of it is unprecedented. Then the next thing is the embeddedness of AI in so many places. You know, it might be winter in computer science, but it ain't going to be winter everywhere. And in, in the past, it was concentrated in a fewer number of fields. But today, that's not the case anymore. AI is just very wide and far. So it's it's gone too far and wide for it to be able to disappear again. Uh, the other bit is the increased technological scientific capability and knowledge around AI. The, the past few decades, especially the last decade, have seen all sorts of really hard and challenging problems in machine learning solved. We've seen uh, also a plethora of uh, tools that make it easier for scientists to use AI like PyTorch or TensorFlow, these coding platforms that allow us to 
quickly code up a piece of AI is putting it into the fingertips of a lot of scientists. So not likely. The, the last the last part is AI just regularly features in all of our lives every day. There's there's AI algorithms running behind the scenes in so many spaces that it's it's ubiquitous and it's out there. So it's likely to transform and change a bit, but our analysis does not suggest we're likely to enter into another winter as of the types experienced through history. If it's not going to be slowing down, how is AI going to sort of continue to potentially transform scientific research going forward? Now, our discussions with experts, and we spoke to many experts in CSIRO and beyond as we did this report, is there'd be a bit of a range of views on what AI is going to do. One, it's going to be really useful. It's going to be very efficient. It's going to help us problem solve, and it's a very helpful tool, but it doesn't fundamentally change how I do my science. The other end of the field is are those who would say, actually, no, AI is going to start to cause you to ask and answer questions fundamentally in a very different way. It's going to be paradigm shifting. It's going to unlock completely new ways of uncovering knowledge. So and I think both ends of that spectrum need to be entertained as we move forward into this world of AI. But the implication for research organizations and researchers is, yeah, this technology matters. It ain't nowhere near as daunting as you might think if you're a researcher who's wondering about getting into it. It doesn't take that many lines of code in PyTorch to be able to implement um, AI within your research, but also code-free, menu-based AI is coming too. And I think that's that's only a, another positive. So this this is something that, that scientists need to get across, need to be able to do. But then the report outlines all the other considerations for research organizations wanting to get into AI. If you're wanting to get into using AI in your research, is there are going to be, you know, some key issues that they're going to have to address and overcome going forward. What are some of those? Firstly, is all the amazing software tools, data resources that you have at your fingertips now, purpose-built processes that are designed to handle matrix algebra and pr speed up that machine learning are already coming into play and having a huge effect. And there's a lot of products there to do that. The software tools, like the platforms such as PyTorch and TensorFlow are two I mentioned, but a lot more, including the emergence of code-free AI is coming too. So there's all these resources. The second thing is data. Right, Most AI is about heaps of data. However, things are changing a little bit. We're seeing scientists move from using massive data sets, which have problems like the big data is great, but it has a lot of problems inside it and it can cause problems as well. We're seeing a switch to smaller, better curated data sets that are fit for purpose and provenance assured. But the um, need to invest in your data assets is pretty critical. Your ability to solve a science question is increasingly, what's a data set that helps me solve this? How can I get that data set? And how can I treat it in all the correct ways to be able to do the analysis and perform the machine learning? There was you know, a review of the use of machine learning in um, computer vision for COVID-19 diagnosis via chest scans that happened during the pandemic. And, you know, understandably, a lot of that stuff was getting rushed through, but this review did find that out of 60 or so, none were clinically applicable. And it was largely due to the crappy data that went into them led to unusable results. And I think that's one of the wake up calls for the machine learning profession and for artificial intelligence is to, to look closely at the data. The third thing I'll pull out is, is the increased societal expectation for ethical application of AI and how transparency, you know, the, they used to say data is a new oil, it's now the new asbestos after we've seen some of the very high profile data breaches, which have had profound impact on people, but expect legislation to get tighter, expect the social license to operate about what you're doing with data, especially if that data is private or confidential in any way, to get a whole lot higher. So I think researchers and research organizations really need to look into the ethics of AI. We, my team wrote the ethics framework for Australia for artificial intelligence, and there's a set of principles on the Australian government website. You know, what are voluntary principles, I think, become legislation in time, actually. I used to not think that was the case, but I think that's the direction that we will head in. I'd say AI also for research institutes has a bit of a diversity problem, has gender diversity but also cultural diversity. The representation of Indigenous persons, for example, in AI workforces is still uh, relatively low and uh, women are also underrepresented in AI workforces. So this is, by now, it's pretty clear to us that more diversity leads to better science outcomes and this is something we need to be looking at in the field of artificial intelligence. <laughs>